2009 is the 400th anniversary of Galileo turning his telescope to the sky. To discuss this is Dr Peter Slezak. He's from the School of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of New South Wales. Dr Slezak, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Hi, Susie. Tell me, what's the significance of this? Well, uh, the 400th year marks uh, Galileo's use of the telescope, which was a very dramatic event for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, not least of all, was the discoveries that he made. Um, he saw things that nobody actually had seen before, which uh, made a huge difference not only to the progress of science and astronomy, but also to the understanding of our place in the universe, and, and that had an impact on uh, the, the conflict with the church about uh, the nature of science and the truth of the Bible. Now, there was a very significant trial about this. Can you outline what happened? Well, Galileo wrote a book uh, in 1632 um, which uh, wanted to present the arguments on both sides. Uh, on the one side was the uh, Copernican system where the Earth was moving uh, both around its own axis and around the Sun. But the traditional position was the Ptolemaic and Aristotelian view, which was that the Earth was at the centre of the universe. Now, that was the view that also was thought to have been um, articulated in the Bible itself. The scriptures say things like uh, um, the sun stood still when, when a miracle happened, and that suggests that the sun was moving. And so it looked like the Copernican system was in conflict with the, uh, the, the scriptures. So the uh, church figures cared a lot about that, and this was uh, regarded as potentially heretical. And so what happened? Well, finally, Galileo was brought to trial. It was provoked by various disgruntled philosophers, I should say, for my own profession, uh, Aristotelians who thought that their um, uh, theories and their professional uh, reputations were at stake. But also uh, there was the serious questions about the conflict with the church. So uh, after a long process, he was actually brought to uh, trial by the Roman Inquisition. And uh, there wasn't a charge, as we would understand today. It was an interrogation. But at the end of it, he was found guilty of what is actually a technical charge or, or finding, a vehement suspicion of heresy. That was actually a technical uh, charge. It wasn't just a suspicion of a charge. It was a, actually a, uh, an accusation. Was it because Galileo was ahead of his time and the church was perhaps of that time? I think it's fair to say he was ahead of his time, but it's important to understand that the case for Copernicanism wasn't clinched yet. It wasn't clear that uh, the Copernican system was correct. The leading astronomers and scientists at the time didn't necessarily agree with Galileo. Clavius, the greatest mathematician and astronomer at the time, actually didn't uh, move over to the Copernican model. He saw uh, the, the uh, uh, observations that uh, Galileo had seen through the telescope, crucial uh, uh, anomalies for the uh, Ptolemaic system, the phases of Venus, uh, the fact that Jupiter had moons, uh, these were not consistent with the uh, earlier Ptolemaic and Aristotelian picture. But still, Clavius didn't change his mind, and, and, and rightly so. The, 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 the story wasn't clinched really until Isaac Newton. So I guess what we're talking about here is the conflict between church and science, and really there was no separation at that time, and that has changed since then. Well, it hasn't completely changed uh, because clearly the conflicts with the Bible are still current uh, disputes. Uh, the question of Darwin and uh, various other issues that, that raise biblical questions are still hot topics. But at the time, it's important to understand that the, uh, Galileo tried to argue for the separation of what they called then questions of, of faith and morals. And he argued that, that, that the, the scriptures are not a scientific text and shouldn't be, be, be looked for, to for, for questions about astronomy. But it wasn't that clear at the time. Uh, certainly not just the leading uh, theologians and, and church people, but even the scientists took the Bible seriously as a source of authoritative claims about the world. And so uh, we look backwards and, and think that that was a mistake, but at the time it wasn't clear. And why was he singled out as opposed to other scientists like like Copernicus? Well, uh, Galileo was singled out because he was pretty provocative. I think he, he, he kind of uh, pushed the church very hard on this. He um, uh, argued strenuously uh, for his uh, position until he was uh, given an edict uh, not to talk about it uh, in, in certain terms. In 1616, he was uh, prohibited from speaking uh, except hypothetically. He was asked to, to consider it as though it, it was just uh, some kind of mathematical fiction and he couldn't discuss it and, and he uh, arguably uh, went against that uh, later. The 1633 trial was actually about what happened in 1616 when he was given a prohibition. Mm. Now in your classes as a philosopher you teach your students about, you, you have a retrial, um, that's one of your um, coursework um, requirements. Tell me about that, well, how did that come about? 
I learned of this uh, at a conference of educators once many years ago when they did something like a retrial and it was a pedagogical device that was a way of illustrating many, many issues. One of the wonderful things about the Galileo Affair is that it raises questions not only about science versus religion and the nature of science and scientific revolutions, it raises questions about, for example, uh, authority and dissent, which is at least a, a large part of what that was about. And many of the questions are still open. And so a wonderful way to, to bring the, the subject to life is to put the, the uh, uh, issues to a retrial. Um, and, and it works because there's a strong case on both sides. It's not as though Galileo, as is widely thought, according to the stereotype, to have been this poor guy who tried to tell the truth and the terrible church simply just came down on him and, and, uh, and uh, um, you know, threatened him with, with heresy. Um, it turns out that the church had a strong case. And so a retrial is, is uh, an important exercise that has, has arguments on both sides. Now, as for doing it as a trial, it's really just a lively way of doing history where instead of just reading the documents and, and the sources that are available, you put them in the mouth of characters, the uh, people that are playing the roles. And so it's really just a, an exciting way to do history. And this time you're doing it with a, a special twist. Tell us about that. It's quite high profile. Well, in this case, uh, instead of using the students and academic staff as we used to, which has always been a lot of fun, we've got some very interesting people uh, playing the parts and uh, going through the exercise. We have uh, um, uh, the astronomer Fred Watson playing Galileo. His defence counsel is Julian Burnside, and the uh, prosecution is Anna Katzman. We have uh, um, Bob Carr playing the uh, Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo de' Medici. Uh, so we have a very interesting group of people, including priests playing the role of uh, the Pope and uh, Cardinal Bellarmine. And this makes it very interesting because these are people that in real life have some related uh, um, um, professional or, 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 or role. And so uh, this brings it to life in an interesting way. So I understand you've got some uh, very high profile people also from the ABC. We have indeed. We've got the science broadcaster Robin Williams. We have the uh, Philosopher's Own uh, broadcaster who is also a philosopher, uh, Alan Saunders. And of course Geraldine Duke from the Compass program is involved as well. So it's a very interesting group of people. Now one thing that is going to happen is that you're looking at, when the retrial, you're looking at it through the, the trial at the time. You obviously aren't taking it into the modern day. So what, what can you conclude from it? I mean, it, well, will the result be the same? Well, in a sense, we are doing it as a modern trial. We're not actually rehearsing or replaying the way it happened in the 17th century. Uh, the reason for that is it wasn't really a trial. It was a kind of inquisition. He came in and he didn't know what the charges were. Um, and uh, uh, so it wasn't a trial as we understand it. But what we're doing actually is putting it into the context of a, a modern trial effectively with, uh, with a jury and, and with uh, prosecution and defence. So we're actually rerunning uh, what was the case then but in a modern context. And do you know ahead of time what the conclusion is going to be? No, we don't. It's not rigged. Uh, what makes it really interesting is precisely because the historical questions are hotly uh, contested, the historians argue about many of the issues, whether he was justly found guilty of uh, vehement suspicion of heresy, uh, what the documents say. Many of the questions are open, and, and that's just the nature of the historical uh, uh, discipline surrounding Galileo. So that means it's a very interesting thing to actually replay, and we don't know the outcome. It'll be for the jury to decide, given the case that's made by the, the players, the so-called historians, uh, in this case, on both sides. So it will be a very exciting night on the 26th. I we'll look to forward to hearing the outcome. Now, history, of course, is judged Galileo very well and the church quite poorly. Why do you think that is? Um, history is very interesting because we tend to do it in hindsight. We tend to use our own standards of judgment, our own understanding of the truth to look backwards. But that can distort the understanding of what happened at the time. In the 17th century, for example, the truth of the Copernican theory wasn't known yet. It wasn't clinched yet. And so many of the scientists hadn't yet uh, accepted Copernicanism. So we can't simply claim that Galileo knew the truth and was, was, was uh, suppressed uh, by the church. Um, the questions of whether religious considerations, whether the scriptures are relevant. At the time, they were still thought to be relevant, and so it's easy for us to look back and say that this was uh, inappropriate of the church to impose on him uh, uh, the requirement uh, to not contradict the scriptures in the literal meaning. Uh, these are uh, uh, hindsight judgments, and history can't be done properly that way. So if we go back to the standards at the time, the question remains open. Okay, so what actually did happen in history is that he was found guilty, and what happened to him then? The trial was actually a miscarriage of justice. He was betrayed. They had a kind of a, a plea bargain and he was going to be allowed to get off more lightly. Um, and they brought up documents and uh, they falsified certain uh, materials. And he was uh, f found uh, much more harshly than was really warranted, I think. 
Uh, the vehement suspicion of heresy wasn't the most serious charge. There was formal heresy, which was the most serious, but it was a very serious charge. And um, whether that was justified or not is, is still, I suppose, uh, arguable. Certainly he was uh, um, pushing very hard against the, the regulations the church had for how the church decides matters. The Protestants were the ones that left it open for people to interpret the scriptures as they would like. But the church had very strict procedures about that. Uh, coming from uh, the Council of Trent and Cardinal Bellarmine, they insisted that it was the fathers of the church that decided uh, how the scriptures should be interpreted. And one of Galileo's most important letters was telling the church how they should do this. And that didn't go down well. So what happened to him? I mean, he was under house arrest or did he, did he continue with his science? He was uh, treated very leniently. Uh, during the trial, he wasn't kept in the dungeons of the Inquisition. He was uh, kept in the, uh, the uh, ambassador of Tuscany's uh, palace. And afterwards, he was uh, confined to his house in Tuscany, in Arquetri, uh, under house arrest, effectively. Uh, so it was a relatively mild punishment. Um, uh, but he was able to pursue his science, and he wrote his most important scientific work uh, subsequently in 1638 about his physics uh, and so on. I mean, it's probably very hard to say, but do you think that had a big effect on other scientists at the time, that, that trial? It did indeed. In fact, uh, it had a chilling effect on, on many people. Uh, for example, uh, um, Descartes. Uh, suppressed his own work at the time in 1633 or thereabouts, having learned of, of Galileo's fate. So that had an effect. Um, on others, it didn't have the same impact because they were out of the reach of the, the Inquisition. Uh, Kepler himself had made uh, spectacular and important uh, contributions to this story, um, and uh, he was out of the reach of the uh, Inquisition, so his work uh, was an important part of the story. Dr. Slezak, we've uh, talked about some of the high profile guests, but we have missed one very important one. You've got the preeminent scholar about Galileo coming here. Tell us about that. Yes, we're very lucky. We have uh, Professor Maurice Finocchiaro coming from uh, the University of Nevada. He's uh, one of the most important figures in uh, the Galileo uh, um, scholarship. He's translated many of the works and written uh, endless numbers of articles. So we're very fortunate to have him. He'll participate in the trial as an expert witness and he's giving a public lecture just before the trial on the Galileo affair from 1633 until today. Fantastic. We'll look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.